How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. We're going to be here for the next two hours talking pro wrestling. We've got Brian Alvarez here, and we're going to have Bruno San Martino up in about a half an hour. So we'll be talking with uh, probably the biggest star in American wrestling during the 60s and 70s and one of the biggest names in the history of this industry. And he was our guest uh, not all that long ago and a uh, very fascinating show. So we're really looking forward to having him back. Uh, very impressed by his memory. He recited this Cow Palace card from, like, 1961. He had the top three or four matches just, boom, right off the top of his head. And I couldn't even remember the top matches on the last TV show I watched. Anyway, so much for that. Brian, how are you today? I'm doing good. That's good. How did the issue turn out? Well, the plan to have the issue done very early fell through. It was not done until about 1.30, but it turned out doing pretty good. So I think it's probably like one of the longest newsletters that I've ever written in my life. But I kind of, I had this thing on the program where you can squeeze the lines together to fit more into the newsletter. So I managed to not have to cut anything out, but it's really long. I cut a lot out last night. You know what's so funny is, you know, I kept thinking, you know, like after we got past WrestleMania, because there's only one promotion in the United States, that I would actually have trouble filling issues. And that has not been the case at all. I mean, I no. cut, you know, I had an ECW story that I'll probably run, that I will run next week. And I didn't even get into the, the business rundown for the months. I'm, I'm going to have to do that one in this coming issue as well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, long story on WCW, uh, on the relaunch of WCW, lots of details and the Memphis stories that, you know, those things. And plus, there's just, there's still a lot of stuff going on. It's not that slow. I mean, so it seems slow, but it's it's not at all, especially last night with the pay-per-view yesterday, actually today, and S SmackDown today. Well, I guess we um I had we'll the opportunity to cut out the heat review, but then I thought to myself, you know, you spent an hour thinking of various ways to make fun of Michael Cole, and uh, <laughs> I thought cut it out. There's no way. You know, I want, I didn't even have room. You know, I I started I started watching um, last night um, in kind of during breaks. I was watching a little bit. I guess um uh, of the uh, the Galavision. I saw a little, just little bits, but I didn't sit there and take notes or anything like that. But I guess the Charlie Manson thing was on the show last night because I got an email about it. Actually, a wow. couple of emails about it that said it was the sickest thing they ever saw. I uh, said it was equal to the Sid Vicious uh, leg break. So you're probably, you're getting a tape of that, aren't you? Yeah, I'll get a tape tonight. And I'm going to be getting a tape probably tomorrow of that match on Saturday, um, the one with June Kasai, you know, where he <laughs> became the human shredder. So we will have some very sick things to look forward to on tape in the next couple of days. Yes. Um, I also I watched the beginning. The first two matches of the ML pay per view and they were um, they were fun matches. I'm gonna watch I'm gonna try to watch that tonight, the rest of the show. But anyway, so much for that. Uh, well by the way, um, later in the show uh, get a pen out. Get a pen and paper out because later in the show uh, we will <laughs> give you the addresses for Observer and Figure Four since we never do that on the show and I've gotten requests to do that, so we'll do it tonight later on. Uh, during the break, um, I don't know, like the one in you know, like an hour and twenty minutes from now or an hour and ten minutes that break, when we talk about the the website and all that other stuff. Anyway, we'll talk about uh, SmackDown last night. Um, let's see, they had uh, a lot of the Ohio Valley uh, guys were there again. Rico Constantino, Randy Orton. They also had Scott Vick and Steve Bradley. Brock Lesnar, Shelton Benjamin. Um, you know, all worked. And uh, people are raving about uh, old Shelton Benjamin, let me tell you. By the way, he will be on the show. Let me get this date. Uh, he will be on a week from Thursday. So Did we ever find uh, out what happened to Ken Shamrock? No, I mean, I just figured that since it's been three no-shows, I think that he just... You know, it's funny because, like, the, the first one, um, I just figured that, uh, you know, it was after the Fujita fight, and I just figured, you know, he did not want to talk about the Fujita fight with me. Um, <laughs> but that's months ago. That was, like, September. Now we're in May. And a couple, you know, several weeks ago, his father called me up and goes, you know, Ken wants to do your show. I go, cool. So uh, we booked a date, and then he canceled, and then we booked a second date. And then he canceled. And then we booked a third date. And I don't even know what happened because he didn't even cancel yesterday. So I just think that you know uh, we should do a deal where we say we're having a tournament of former guests. Then there's no way you can no show. I don't get that. He's got that reputation. You can never finish a tournament. Okay, how, could he, how does he not no show? I don't get it though. Well, he'd have to. Okay. Okay. I don't. I still don't get it. But anyway, we got to. Uh, before we get into that, the the uh, backlash pay per view. Uh, on, uh, here, here's the situation. The top match, it's going to be Undertaker and Kane, who are the tag team champions now. Uh, def all four belts are staked against Austin and Triple H. So, but basically, if Undertaker and Kane lose, then whoever, then, then Austin and Triple H add the tag team titles. They did this once with Diesel and Sean 
against, uh, wasn't Owen Hart and British Bulldog, where Diesel and Sean won the tag team titles, and they'd already held, like, the Intercontinental in the world. And uh, then I think they split up as a tag Didn't team. Didn't they have to vacate them, like, the next night or something like that? Yeah, something like that. I mean, it was it was really bogus. You know, it was another one of those issues where Shawn Michaels didn't drop a title in the ring. So I guess that means that Hunter and Austin are going to win. No, but they can't because the you next know what they could do? I think there's either two ways to do it. They either have uh, Hunter and Austin win, so they have all the belts, mm-hmm. or they just do the deal where Kane pins Hunter, wins the Intercontinental belt, and then there's your feud right there. So Hunter would be uh, challenging. Could be. They could do it that way. I had thought. I don't think Undertaker's winning that world title or Kane. There's no way. Don't say there's no way, but I don't I'm think, saying I think, there's no way. That means that they may prove you wrong. Um, <laughs> but um, I don't know. I, I think that taking putting the world title on Undertaker that'd be a big mistake. Um, but anyway, they did that. They did that one once before. So anyway, that's it. They're going to have Chris Benoit and and Kurt Angle basically doing a combination. The way this program was originally supposed to be. As of, uh, yeah, let's see, the booking meeting was Tuesday morning. So as of Monday was that uh, they were going to do the tag team match in this pay-per-view, and then they were going to go to singles with uh, Benoit and Angle where they were going to do a submission match and then follow it up with an Iron Man match. Well, instead they've canceled the tag team after all this time of building it up on TV, and they're doing the Iron Man submission match, so it's 30 minutes, and uh, you can only win your falls on a submission. There's no pinfalls. So um, they are going to get a chance to do a lot of submissions. So in other words, we could have had three pay-per-views worth of Kurt Angle versus Chris Benoit, and now it's going to be one. No, we still may get three. Um, it's just that we're getting the they just they're just going to do different matches. Um, thirty minutes submission only. You know, I mean that takes away the Olympic slam, that takes away the um, diving headbutt. headbutt. Um, it takes away a lot of false finishes. I mean, it takes away every. False, you know. I mean, gonna be, I mean, we're gonna get a lot of submissions and rope breaks, and I guess it depends on how well for 30 minutes the crowd in uh, Chicago will buy it. Chicago is a good crowd. In fact, it's one of the best crowds in the country. So, you know, maybe may a hell of a match. Of course, uh, you know, one of the things that I liked that they did on SmackDown was the deal where Kurt Angle comes out and he has his lackeys come out and he basically submits them with the ankle lock, a choke, and I think one other thing, an arm bar or something like arm that. Arm bar, arm bar. Yeah. So anyway. At least they're getting over like a whole bunch of different submissions, as opposed to the last submission match, which uh, what was it like Jericho and what was it Benoit Rock? That's right, Benoit Rock, and they really only teased one submission for each guy. So yeah, these guys would be on the mat trying things, and nobody would care because in the back of their minds, everyone's thinking, okay, Benoit's only going to win with the cross face, and Rock is only going to win with that uh, sharpshooter, Sharp whatever. Shooter. So I, I like the fact that they're trying to get over the the fact that any submission can put a guy out. Yeah. Well, I think that's Paul Heyman booking, because um, mm-hmm. that's just the way he thinks. Uh, I don't know that, but pretty good idea. Uh, let's see. So then Regal and Jericho are going to go in a, I think it's called a British Rules match, which I don't know what the stipulations of a British Rules match are. I'm guessing rounds, but I could be wrong on that. Uh, and then they're going to do a big show in Shane McMahon, which we'll explain in just a second. Anyway, uh, uh, yeah, I know. Uh, let's see, SmackDown opens with Regal coming out and basically yelling at Undertaker and Kane for getting in people's business like they did last night at the end of the show on Raw. And he orders a Kane-Rhino match for the hardcore title. And basically Edge and Christian and Rhino um, all come out. And uh, so do Austin and Triple H. And uh, so Undertaker's brawling with... Um, Undertaker's brawling with Edge and Christian and Rhino. And then Hunter and Triple H are killing Kane with chair shots. And then Austin basically gets Rhino and throws him on top of Kane, and Rhino wins the hardcore title. Uh, then it was the APA and Kai and Tai beating RTC, and Taka Michinoku actually pinned uh, one of them. I think he pinned Bull Buchanan. Uh, so then, uh, let's see, uh, Undertaker asks where Regal's office is, and then when he's told, he tells the guy, oh, by the way, call 911. So later in the show, not much later. She um, said call the fire department. Yeah, well, they set the, they set his table on fire, and uh, with Regal's table on fire, they demanded a match against Austin and Triple H, and um, Regal said that they could get the match, but only if they win the tag team titles in an ODQ match against Edge and Christian. And then right then, when I read that, it was like, it's all downhill from there, because yep. Edge and Christian against Undertaker and Kane are going to get killed, even with help from Hunter and Austin, which, by the way, is what happened. Um, 
And uh, by the way, if Vince ever says that we do not do arson on our telecasts, he's lying. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Shane showed up in the Nitro Mobile. And uh, let's see. Let's see. Eddie Guerrero. Eddie Guerrero beat Grandmaster Sex A to keep the European title. Uh, let me see what else. So anyway, then there's the big thing with uh, Vince calls out Shane and uh, shows the footage of Shane talking to Big Show on Monday. By the way, Brian, before we get into that, uh, you watched the tape of, of that interview unedited. What did he say? Or did he say anything? Or do you have any idea? I have absolutely no idea what he said because I played it back like ten times. I turned the volume all the way up on the computer, and you just cannot tell what he said. I mean, if you if you think in your mind that he said goof, you can hear it. But if you think in your mind that he said something else, you can hear that too. So I don't know what he said. I guess we'll find out when they air the footage on uh, SmackDown. I mean, oh, if they edited. that footage again, maybe they'll, 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 do the, they'll, they'll do the same bleep, I think, unless they don't have to. Unless they it was won't. obvious he said goof, and then that's why they're airing it, is because they want people to know that's what he said. Well, I guess we'll find out on Thursday. So anyway, uh, he accuses uh, Shane of trying to steal the big show, but uh, eventually <laughs> he comes to his senses and goes, you can take him. I don't care. <laughs> He's a big uh, flop anyway. And he, actually said, he actually basically says that. Um, and then uh, he tells Big Show, you know, he's got to make a choice which side he's going with. So Big Show grabs his hand and starts to choke Vince, stops choking Vince, and then choke slams Shane. And then Vince orders Big Show against Shane on Backlash. Then they have a tables match with the Dudleys against uh, Jericho and Benoit, which to me, if the whole idea is, is that Benoit and Jericho don't like each other, but they're teaming together for a common goal, which is the fact that they don't like Regal and Angle, then why would they be fighting the Dudleys, who they have no issue with, if they don't like each other? But anyway, I think on Monday it was it was kind of clear that they kind of like each other now. I okay. mean, they held each other's arms up and everything. It wasn't like you know the last time, the last couple of times they made the save for each other, they just glared at each other and walked off. So you know the angle there was they don't like each other, but you know they respect each other enough that they'll help each other in this feud. Now it's like, well, we like each other now. Okay, well, evidently so, because they wrestled the match, it's a tables match, and Angle pushes Benoit off the top ropes. Benoit goes through a table. Didn't go through very clean, uh, but uh, anyway, so the Dudleys won that match. Then, uh, let me see what we had from there. Uh, Isn't it strange how the tables match, the rules change? Like, sometimes you have to put both guys through, and then sometimes it's only putting one guy through. Yeah, well, it's, 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 you're right. And then sometimes, who knows? Sometimes they'll, they'll do pinfalls on tables match someday, too, some, you know. Yeah. China beat Molly Holly. Heard that match was really bad because China sells nothing. Uh, then they have the Angle Submission Clinic, which we talked about earlier. Uh, I think it's uh, Doug Basham, Nick Dinsmore, and uh, Ray Steele. Those were the three guys. And he basically submits all of them. And then uh, Kurt Angle comes out and, uh, not Kurt Angle, Chris Benoit comes out and puts uh, Kurt Angle in the cross face. And Kurt Angle gave the crowd a BA when he was leaving, which is uh, it's not a first in the WWF because I've seen Shawn Michaels and Billy Gunn do it many times, but I bet it's the first time Kurt Angle has done it at least since since high school. <laughs> and then uh, Undertaker and Kane against Edge and Christian in an ODQ match. Uh, Austin and Triple H killed Kane, so Undertaker was left alone with Edge and Christian, and he killed both of them and pinned Christian with the last ride. And that was it. So no Hardys. Um, no Hardys at all on the show. They may have an explanation on TV. Now, what did yeah, I they're hear? dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, um, the, the deal as far as what happened and why it happened um, with Hunter, as far as, okay, now as far as the what happened in that ring and Hunter not selling and all that, that, now that is nobody's fault except for Hunter. And then, because he worked out that match. So that can be blamed on him. Hunter winning cannot be blamed on Hunter because Vince McMahon booked the main event, and when he booked the main event, he wanted that all-titles gimmick, so Hunter did have to win the title back. In fact, Hunter was never really even supposed to lose the title, but they decided, hey, let's just do it. But when he, even when he lost it, I mean, it was one of those things where they, they even, even if they wanted to keep it going because of the way the pay-per-view had been laid out. Um, with the big guys? It, with the big guys, um, the, the, the way the pay-per-view had been laid out, Hunter had to be Intercontinental Champion, plus for the uh, England show he had to be your, I mean, Intercontinental Champion. So um, he had to regain it when he lost it. He, he never had, had to lose to. it. That was Vince's doctrine, yes, had to. It wasn't, that wasn't Hunter. That was, that was Vince. So 
I mean, because he had the main event booked, and then they just had to get there. And they could get there any way they wanted. Um, and how they got there, you can argue about. <laughs> and even that is quite quite strange. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, let's see. What do we have for a poll here um, for today? How do you feel about the backlash main event of Undertaker and Kane versus Triple H and Austin? A, uh, we'll order the show because I always order WF pay-per-view shows, which is actually where I would fit in. B, we'll order the show because I like the match. C, we'll order the show because all the belts are at stake. D, we'll, we'll not order the show because of that main event match. And E, don't watch WF pay-per-view. So that's the deal there. Uh, let me get to the poll for yesterday, which is what did you think of Raw? 11% said excellent. 40% said good. I think that's I would I would be, yeah, I would be good because if it wasn't for, if the main event was had a different storyline to it, I would have actually said excellent, but I'd go with good. 33% said average. 10% said bad. 6% said awful. Uh, let's see. Today, it's the Hardys uh, and their family. What? <laughs> At six percent. Yeah. The uh, let's see. The um, Budokan Hall today. Zero one had their pay per view, which on paper looked like a terrible show, but in fact was a really good show from all the reports I got. Uh, let's see. Tatsuhito Takaiwa beat Naomichi Marafuji, which I would have expected to be really good, and uh, Marafuji looked really good. And apparently, anyway. Heard that was a very good opener. Second was Nao Hiro Hoshikawa beat Mr. X, who turned out to be, uh, the mystery man turned out to be George Takano under a mask, who was actually a really good worker in the mid-80s, but uh, now he's overweight. And he looked, he's overweight and he looked bad. Actually, I heard that the match had no heat, but um, was a decently worked match. Alexander Osuka beat You know, Takashi when you think Su of the mid-80s, that's almost yes. 20 years ago now. Well, 1984, 17 years ago was when uh, the Cobra... Was at its at his peak uh, when he had the feud with Dynamite Kid and all those people for the was it was the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Title? No, it was, it was then in those days. I think it was the uh, WWF Junior Heavyweight Title. IWGP mm -hmm. didn't come till later. Uh, he was the guy who was the successor to Satoru Sayama, and unfortunately, um, he was the successor to Satoru Sayama because even though he was good, it was like death. You know, it's like you're, you're put in this position. Satoru Sayama was like the next so John Michaels, the next Ric Flair. It's like the next Ric Flair, yeah, exactly. Um, pretty tough. Although I remember years ago, um, when when Steve Austin was a rookie, everybody said he was going to be the next Ric Flair, and I said, God, that's the kiss of death. And he actually, in many ways, was a bigger star than Ric Flair ever was. Mm -hmm. So maybe not a better worker, but, um, you know, but a bigger star. Okay, Alexander Otsuka beat Takashi Sugiora, which this was a sick match because the, the whole idea of this match was they were going to open up and they were going to split both of their heads open by headbutting each other as hard as they could. So that's Regal what they and did. And, um, what? Regal and Benoit. Regal and, Re Regal and Benoit, exactly. And Otsuka has just, um, Otsuka had fought Guy Metzger at uh, King of the Cage uh, a couple of weeks ago. Maybe he made a little more than that. So he's got a lot of scar tissue. So he was busted open really bad. And um, Sugiura, who's a, a rookie, he's only been wrestling like four months um, and has never bladed in a match. Um, he didn't bust open much. He had a little bit of a cut, but uh, heard that that was a very, very good match. Sugiura is um, going to be something. He already is something. I mean, and then in the the absolute uh, most uh, <laughs> just go to the website and read Dave's review of this match. Yeah, the most un inexplicable result that I think I have ever heard in, in, in my entire life. Sean McCulley knocked out Shinjiro Otani with. Uh, or actually, no, no, I take that back. He beat him with an armbar he submission. Submit. Yeah, he made him submit to an armbar with punches from the mount. And I cannot, <laughs> I don't even know what to say. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's like, oh, now, what, now what's going to happen? Like, I mean, they're not going to do anything with Sean McCulley. They can't. So anyway, <laughs> I don't know what Shinjiro Otani has done in his life. But uh, he must have done something very, very bad. And he bad was doing too. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. He got up to two. But they wanted him to get up to two thirty because they they said, you know, we've got to remake you. You can't be a junior heavyweight. So he gets up to two thirty. You know, he's usually about two hundred pounds. He loses like ninety five percent of his ability because he's too heavy. And then they just, then, then he gets that. Uh, then the first thing he does is he gets a world title shot with Kensuke Sasaki um, on that. Um, that was the pay per view, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. And the pay per view actually did. And the pay per view did very well, as I recall, which which was stunning because. You know, Otani, why would Otani be ready for a world title shot in a pay-per-view? And he loses that match, and then he comes back and uh, 
you know, the, not the next pay-per-view he does, but, this, but because he, they did one other one, uh, I forget what happened at that, um, what did Otani do? Oh, Otani was with Murakami at the, at the uh, Kazunari Murakami at the first zero one, which was a hell of a match. I mean, I was like, I thought that was maybe the best match on that whole show. It was awesome. And now he's got to lose in four minutes and 50 seconds to an arm bar to a nobody. So anyway, Shinya Hashimoto and Tadao Yasuda beat Masao Inoue and Taman Honda. And I mean, this match was just being ridiculed everywhere for the idea that Honda and Inoue had no business, you know, being in a semi main event. And obviously, they felt they had something to prove, and apparently, they did really good. They wrestled way over their heads, and it was a really good match, but, um, in a way, ended up dislocating his shoulder legitimately, and the match ended up having to be stopped. But, um, hmm. anyway, um, um, but I heard it was a very exciting match. And then the main event was, uh, Mitsuharu Masao and Takeshi Rikio over Murakami and Naoya Ogawa. It's only six minutes and 40 seconds, but it was a hell of a six minutes and 40 seconds. The complaint, of course, was it was too short. And that Misawa trying to work shoot was very strange. Uh, Misawa got a phenomenal reaction coming out because this is actually his first match back at Budokan Hall, which is the site of all of his big wins uh, since the uh, split, you know, since he left. And mm -hmm. Rikio apparently must have done really good because when the show was over, Hiroshi Hase, who did the commentary, said that Rikio was the best guy on the entire show. And I heard. Uh, wow. So anyway, uh, they also announced that there would be uh, Pancras guys on the uh, June 24th pay per view. Uh, yesterday you were talking about. How Prince Justice looked like a mix between Rhino Paul White and the bad Terry Gordy. I didn't say the bad Terry Gordy. I questioned which Terry Gordy looked like when someone said that. He just he goes, I just got my family pictures in, and in those my face looks like a combination of Rhino and the bad Terry Gordy. So much for making me feel good. <laughs> okay, let's see. This is from Lance Holder who goes, What is the background of S.A. Rios? Um, it's just a wrestler, a luchador Latino. from um, uh, from <laughs> from Guadalajara who learned how to fly long before he learned how to wrestle, and now he's trying to catch up. And is actually pretty damn good and never gets on TV anyway, and he's the object of derision because he's short, and uh, that's what happens when you're short in the WWF. How old is Gangrel? I believe 35 or 36. Is there a Memphis Championship wrestling title? If so, who currently has it? Uh, there is. I think it's called the Southern Heavyweight title, and the last I heard Steve Bradley held it, but that was a couple of weeks ago, so if I'm wrong, somebody will probably write in and let us know. Uh, did Jim Duggan, Dustin Rhodes, Bam Bam Bigelow, or Medeja receive their termination papers? Um, I think Dustin Rhodes did. The others, if they have not, they almost assuredly will, but uh, I don't know. What is the status of Nicole Bass' lawsuit against the WF? It's still out there. It hasn't been thrown out yet. I think there was uh, just an article on it a couple of days ago somewhere. Oh, really? What did it say? I haven't I can't heard remember. Anything. I didn't read it. Oh, okay. I was just address this. Was there. Okay, address this as part of her claim. Quote, in another event... This one nationally televised, she was subjected to motions made when her back was turned by a male wrestler, which simulated a sexual act directed towards her buttocks. She was never told this would happen beforehand by the WF. What is this referring to? Does anyone know what guy I have no idea. did that? What sick man did that <laughs> in the WF? I can believe it happened. I can even picture certain guys there doing it. Road Dog. I, I think it might have been him or uh, Shawn Michaels. Because didn't Shawn Michaels like have some confrontation with her where he where she he sort of like called her a man or something? I think that was Shawn. Yeah, it might have been Shawn. And certainly, you know, let's see. She uh, must not have read the small print in the contract about leave your dignity at the door. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everyone that goes there, you know, I I or or is thinking of going there. I go like, you know, I mean, I and I basically encourage almost everyone because if you want to stay in wrestling, you got to. But I do mention that, that it may not be in your contract, but just think of it as the um, unwritten part of your contract. Because, I mean, that's just that's just reality. Uh, this is from Ben. With no competition anymore, wouldn't it be logical time to get over guys like Benoit, Jericho, and Angle as main event guys? Especially Angle. He already he was, so, he was there. You? Yeah, wouldn't you think so? After watching the Hardys take a big step down on the food chain on Raw and then reading the SmackDown results, I'm convinced Vince has the worst memory in wrestling. WCW was destroyed, among other things because they refuse to elevate new talent. I'm hopeful but not optimistic that things can get better. Um, how will I say this? Until things get worse, I think that they can't get better. And hopefully when things get worse, uh, then they will realize that that's the time you have to make the changes. But it's best to make the changes when things are good and not when they're bad. Uh, because then what not, happens... Not is even things... necessarily make them, but start moving in that direction. You know, make some of them. 
You know, it's not like you have to totally replace Austin Hunter and all these guys. But no, you don't replace anyone. You they just need, get people guys need to be at their built, level. built up now. So when the time comes, people will, you know, like just with Jeff Hardy, we were talking about on Monday. Jeff Hardy was put in this position, and nobody believed that he was ready. Now, if he'd been built up, you know, for the past six months as almost being ready, then when this would have happened, everybody would have accepted it. So they need to do more building now. And, you know, maybe some guys can, uh, you know, like Angle, hit that top spot and stay there as opposed to hitting it and being sent back down to the mid-card. But, or the mid-card guys being sent even lower, like the Hardys. But it's something they need to start doing now, and they just aren't doing it. This is for you, Brian. Because could you please tell us about your wrestling career, your height and weight, and how you got into wrestling? My wrestling career, I have a tape available on the website. I, it's pretty much all I can say about that. I'm 5'7", I'm 169 today, and I got started about two years ago when I was doing refereeing work for a group up here called, uh, I don't remember what it was called, UIWA with Dave Debashi. And he gave me a shot refereeing, and then Tim gave me a shot a month later wrestling, and I've wrestled for Tim ever since. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'd like to comment that I think William Regal is my favorite all-around personality. He is the funniest. I usually record Raw and SmackDown and find myself fast-forwarding a lot more than usual, but whenever Regal comes on the screen, he's a breath of fresh air. With a lot of characters in serious roles like Triple H, Regal is hilarious. I'm still anticipating a big match with Regal against someone like Benoit. I've heard they've had stellar matches, but only having <laughs> access to the WF in Ireland, I have not seen any of their matches. Well, you'll get to see one Friday um, on the UK version. It's, it's short. It's a five-minute match, but... Uh, You'll get to see one on the pay-per-view. Yeah, the pay-per-view, you'll really get to see one that'll probably be very good. Uh, who in your opinion? Bruno's on the line? Well, let's get to, let's get to Bruno San Martino. Bruno, how are you doing today? Hello, who am I speaking to? Dave Meltzer and Brian Alvarez. Hello, Dave, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. What's been, uh, what's been going on with you? What have you been, uh, what have you been up to since the last time we spoke? Well, uh, Let's see, what month did I speak to you last? I don't even remember. It's probably about two months ago. Two months? Ago. Was it after I came back from Europe? Oh, yeah, yeah, we talked about uh, going to Italy or anything Well, like that. I yeah. just came back again last week. I was there again. Oh, okay. oh. And so it was a nice trip. I went uh, back to my town, took my wife with me so she could, because last time was such a rush trip, and uh, this time we went and uh, to absorb the thing a little bit more, to you know, and spent some time with the people. I still have relatives and friends there. And yeah, so it was a real, real great uh, trip, and, and we just got back last week. So that's what's been happening with me. How long, so you were there? how long was I over there? About uh, just, what, 12 or 13 days. And you went back to your uh, original hometown and saw the statue and everything, too? Oh, yeah, well, sure, because my wife had not seen any of it. Because the first time, you know, it was such a rushed thing. I, I, I went and had to come back, so, um, so that's why we went back. And, uh, yeah, so... She saw everything, and uh, and again, we had a lot more time to kind of absorb the whole thing, not only the uh, statue, but, you know, she got to see the, the home, but not only uh, they opened the house for us, so she, she could really look at the, the home that my parents built, the home that I was born in and all that, and then that sports facility and so forth, and then spend a lot of time with the uh, townspeople because they're very, very nice, and they uh, only want you to stop in their houses and all that, and they... Re Told stories when we were kids and stuff like that. So it, it was a really, really wonderful. Uh, it was just great. You know, but one thing for the people who did not listen to the show the first time you were on, um, you know, why don't you tell us a little bit? Uh, you went to a uh, Pizza Ferrado. Is that the name of the town you were? Hey, in? pretty good. Yeah, Pizza that's Ferrado. Close. That's uh, that's correct. Okay, and just uh, they, uh, I guess around December or so, whatever it was, they. So just tell about, like, the different things they did in honor of you there. Okay. Well, December the 8th is a big holiday in Italy. Well, I guess uh, here, too, for Christians, it's called the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. And in our town, of course, it's a very big, uh, big holiday. And they chose that day to, uh, to, uh, to honor me. And uh, what they did, which was a, a really surprised for me because I had no inkling. Uh, believe me when I tell you, I don't know if you remember the coach uh, for the Pittsburgh Steelers, a guy by the name of Chuck Noll. Chuck oh, of course. Chuck saying that when you were through, when he felt you were through playing football, that you should go on with the rest of your life. And that's exactly how I felt with uh, with uh, my career in wrestling. When I, once I retired, I thought that was all behind me, and I'd go on with the rest of my life. So when these things came up, like the being honored for my weightlifting career and all that, these were all uh, tremendous surprises. But this one in Italy, this was a shocker for me. It was really overwhelming and so forth, because they built this... Uh, 
sports facility, which they put my name to it. Then it, in uh, the home that my parents built and the home that I was born in and that, you have to understand and understand where I come from. There were no doctors or anything like that in, in those mountains. So, you know, you, you were born in no hospitals or anything. You were born in your own home, and you had a, what uh, I guess they call the midwives who helped out, uh, you know, with the births and all that. And so uh, that home, uh, they put a slab of... Uh, uh, of a uh, marble on the side, it's pretty big, and it says this is, uh, you know, this is the home that Bruno San Martino was born in, and uh, the, and then the uh, um, the third, of course, is the monument that they did, and the uh, and then that night they had a play, which this I, I had no inkling about. It was quite a shocker to me, and the play was about my life. But it wasn't my life as far as, uh, like, my wrestling career or anything like that. It was about this kid who, uh, uh, who during the war, when we were hiding from the Nazis, and we went to uh, a mountain called the Valaraca, where we spent 14 months, and uh, they were 14 months of sheer hell because, first of all, there was starvation and no food. Second of all, uh, the winters in those mountains, one has to experience to believe how ferocious they are. And thirdly, uh, the, the constant bombings that uh, that were always coming around. And so uh, to survive all that, uh, you have to be extremely fortunate. And, of course, uh, we were among the lucky ones because many did not make it. And so then when my father had already come here but prior to the war, then all passages were closed, and he was stuck here, and we were stuck there. So my poor mom was stuck with her kids, and, uh, and she we were very young, and so she... Um, had to make all kinds of uh, sacrifices and take a lot of chances and so forth for for our survival. And, of course, uh, we did survive. And then when uh, my dad and my mom connected again, my dad asked the question, you know, should I come back? Uh, Because those were the plans. He would work here, like so many foreigners, to build a life for over there. That's how my dad uh, saved up for the money to build the house. And he was a blacksmith by trade. So he... Uh, he was going to go back eventually after he had bought uh, enough land because we lived off our land over there. And the, in the house, he had uh, built a shop at the basement for his uh, blacksmith work. And that was the uh, the gold. But, of course, everything then uh, was changed because of the war. And when the question came up, uh, should he still come back or try to bring us over, my mom said, uh, you know, for the kids' sakes, I think it's best if you, if you could try to get us over there because there will be more opportunities for them uh, to live a normal life than, than over here because over here it's it's so you know so destroyed that uh, that uh, what future's there you know and so the decision was made and that's when my dad started uh, doing what he had to do uh, and finally in 1950 he was able to bring us over here and that's basically you know the story now, now, how how old were you when you were living in the mountains? Were you probably like what five, six years old, or is that right? No, no, I was a little older than that because after the fall of uh, of Mussolini, you know, where <laughs> the Germans didn't take too kindly to to us, uh, uh, and they came and invaded our area. It was around uh, forty, the middle of forty three to forty five. So I was born in thirty five, nineteen thirty five. So you know, I, we're talking about from the time of eight to ten years of age. Okay. Uh, now, now, did you did you first um, when you moved to the United States? Was it to Pittsburgh originally, or did you live somewhere before Pittsburgh? No, no. Uh, my father, uh, my father had come here to work, and the reason why he came to Pittsburgh was because some friends uh, uh, were able to, uh, as they tried to help each other in getting jobs, and so it started out where somebody got him a job working construction. And so it was here in Pittsburgh. So my dad uh, had come to Pittsburgh because this is where there was a job waiting for him. And so that's how it became our home, you know. Now, this is a totally in a, in a different direction, and on back to wrestling and everything. Okay. What were your thoughts um, when the when you basically got the word? I know you don't follow wrestling closely. Yeah. That basically the the ECW was done and the WCW for was done, and Vince McMahon basically now actually has it all yeah well you know uh, uh you know uh yeah you're right i i never never watch it but i do get calls i have friends who keep calling me they they, they need to inform me they, they need to tell me what's going on <laughs> and again and again as i give my opinion i know there'll be people out there who'll say well you know he doesn't like vince mcmahon so what do you expect him to say I, I honestly believe, and I say this in all sincerity, I, I, that for, for, for the wrestlers, that they're they're all going to be the big losers. Uh, you see, in the long run, no doubt. 
You yeah. know, I mean, McMahon now, you want to talk a monopoly. I mean, uh, now, let's supposing that uh, some of the guys uh, may not be uh, happy with uh, the way they're treated, the contract when it expires. You know, McMahon says, take it or leave it. What are they going to mm-hmm. do? Where are they going to go? I mean, they're going to find that this was the worst thing, in my opinion, in my opinion, this was the worst thing that could have possibly happened to professional wrestling. And I think that uh, down the road, uh, a lot of people are going to find just that out. Do you think that Vince will start taking advantage of people because of that down the road? Absolutely. Well, he's been pretty good so far, but, you know, a year down the road, who knows? Absolutely. I think that he will. I think, in fact, don't be surprised that... Uh, if he doesn't try to develop even some newer talent, and that uh, so that he can start uh, getting rid of the, uh, the so-called uh, superstars of today, who may be a little more demanding and so forth and so on, that he can bring uh, uh, a new crew, so to speak, of uh, younger talent, and he can give them whatever he wants, and they'll be thrilled uh, to uh, to have the opportunity. Uh, not having been spoiled by the big contracts that I'm hearing that are given out there. And so uh, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if uh, some of the uh, bigger guns, as, as younger people are developed, and uh, uh, McMahon, I'm sure, is hoping that he can develop into, them into becoming uh, stars so that he can start eliminating these other people. And he'll have basically a, uh, an organization with, uh, with the payroll one after be too high, so that maybe if uh, NBC do- uh, gets away from the XFL, if he chooses to uh, to continue on his own, uh, he you know he'll have more money to uh, to lose with that because he won't be giving it to the wrestlers. Well, they just they just came out with uh, something today on that. They're uh, they, they're estimating the losses actually the, the losses so far this year, uh-huh. which is not all that long since we're talking January first. Of seventy six million on the XFL. Oh my goodness! For just the WWF, or is that like no, 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 WWF no, 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 half WWF, half NBC. WWF will have lost thirty eight, and NBC will have lost thirty eight okay. on, the, on, the, oh on it. Oh my God! I, no, I didn't know that. I, I had heard. This came out today. I had heard that maybe they were estimating. I think NBC came out a few months ago that they were estimating that they could lose up to thirty million. But my goodness, seventy six million. Um, that's just so far. I mean, there'll still be more losses. Now, if NBC pulls out, but I think. I think the if way they the pulled out the next year, that would be seventy-six million. If they lost exactly the same, just for Vince, right? Okay, but 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 uh, there's something in the contract. If NBC pulls out, they have to pay a penalty to Vince because they committed for two years. So, um, and I think the penalty is pretty darn high. And I also, from um, uh, of the understanding that NBC is quite willing to pay that penalty. I think I saw somewhere that that number was fifty million. Fifty. So, fifty-five zero that they will pay fifty million wow. to get out of the contract next year. Um, I don't know. Now, I don't know that one. I don't know if that figure to be true. That was a figure that I read somewhere. But even even so, they're going to lose. So really, prob- if, if Vince if Vince got out of it, and they paid him fifty million, he could come oh, out no, no, on no, top. No, 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 no. He would have to continue operating it for them to pay him on that. Because if oh, the league okay, okay. folds, they don't have to pay anyone anything. I don't think. Okay. So so he, that may be a reason that he goes for the second season. But even so. They're going to lose more money the second season than the first because they won't have the good first weeks. They're not going to be able to sell ad time, and uh, and you know the, the ticket sales you know went so far down as the league went on. So they're going to have a lot lower ticket sales next year. Well, so you know he's still going to lose a ton of money even well, even with fifty million. That's exactly what I was going to say. If uh, they may give him fifty million if he continues, but I believe that the losses would be greater. Uh, a second year than they were even the first year, and so instead of 76, who knows? They might be uh, 90 and 100. So even if he does get 50 million from them, uh, look how much it's still going to have to come out of his own pocket. But you know what? I don't believe Mick. Well, and this is just gut feeling because I don't know anything about what he's going to do. But I, I think that McMahon is talking uh, uh, game right now about that uh, if NBC gets out that he'll continue on. But I don't buy it. I think that there'll come a time when he's going to say. Uh, uh, for whatever reason uh, they will come up with, and if NBC folds uh, or gets out of this, they say they are. I, I don't think, I don't believe McMahon will continue on his own. I really don't. You know, one of the things that I think a lot of fans today don't realize, because there's there's not a lot of history on wrestling, no. and then if you go back to say the '60s, there was wrestling in so many, you know, like like you know we talk about a, like a Brazil or a France or a Spain or. India or Pakistan. I mean, all of these countries actually had professional wrestling, and now very huge few crowds. of them do. 
Yeah, I, and did you do you even know why? I mean, I know you went. You probably went to a lot of them, but it was. It was a, I mean, it's one of those things where I look back at, at like uh, old newsletters and I see like, my God, there was, you know, or England, like where you read about like that they would have you know thirty shows a night in England or something. Yeah. Um, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that. And I'm going like, there was so much wrestling during this period where people think there was no wrestling and now when people think that wrestling's so big there's actually as far as matches there's not a whole hell of a lot of matches every night now that, that's true uh, Dave uh, uh, for example like in the 60s like when I was touring uh, South America uh, my goodness uh, they had a lot of wrestling going on in all those uh, countries uh, you know whether it be in Argentina and Brazil I mean I remember in Caracas in Venezuela they had this old stadium that used to have bullfights many years ago I guess and it, 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 there were about let's see what is it all 38,000 people and we can complete sellout they must have turned them away by the thousand that's how big and popular it was in manila uh in in 68 i don't remember the year for sure but same thing i mean you know in the big 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 building i don't know the name of the building but same thing i mean it was uh really big yeah i'm glad you said that because a lot of people think that wrestling is big today but yesteryear, it was like Mickey Mouse. Like I heard one time, which, in, which I was insulted by, it. Hogan said in an interview that they took wrestling from the s small, smoke-filled, uh, back alley uh, oh, yeah, play to the, to the main <laughs> arenas. You know, I found that so offensive because uh, uh, we were in all the big arenas, you know, for not only when I started, but, of course, way before my time ever came. And to suggest that... Uh, that wrestling was was like that back then. Uh, he, I would tell people like him and others that uh, there was a heck of a lot more respect for professional wrestling back in those days than certainly there is today. You know, one thing, a uh, couple of questions that we got early in the week before, uh, then when people found out you were going to do the show. There's a question um, a couple of people asked me about, and I really wasn't aware of this, but um, they, a lot of people have asked, is there still any tension with you and Larry Zbysko? Is there tension between me and Larry Zabisco? Not yeah, as far as I'm concerned, but I haven't. Well, uh, uh, let me put it this way. We haven't seen each other or talked to each other for many, many, many years. We are not on friendly basis, but not uh, because of, uh, you know, what happened uh, in 1980. Uh, there, I really don't like to get into it, but there's a couple other things that have happened that I think it... Uh, uh, I'll just go as far as just saying that I was uh, at some disappointments concerning uh, Zabisco and that friendship. There, there's no friendship. Let, let, let me put it that way. Okay. Um, let's, you know, there's another question we got here. Uh, a couple people have asked and brought up uh, Tony Marino, who you uh, dubbed. Was, was that your idea to call him Batman in the 60s? Absolutely Pittsburgh? not. Tony Marino was wrestling oh. <laughs> as the Batman, and when I was in uh, uh, Pittsburgh, he c contacted me to come in. But Tony knew... Um, and that's why he was trying to convince me, because I was very, very outspoken in those days. I did not like gimmicks. I wanted guys to go in a ring with tights and boots and, and, and that. And I, I, I absolutely always despised gimmick from the first day I got into the business. And I told so he contacted me because he knew that I had the, some say so. And I said, Tony, you, 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 you look tremendous. You know, Tony had competed in the Mr. America contest back in 1951 and 52. He had a great uh, physique and all that. And I said, and he, and he had a, a background. You know, I mean, he was a good athlete. He played football too, besides wrestling. And I said, he said, please. He says, I beg of you, just to to let me come in so I get some attention because he hadn't uh, for, for whatever reason he had never gotten a real break in wrestling he said let me just come in with this he says and then he says we'll take it off he says we'll come up with a reason why you know it's going to come off but just so it will make a little bit of an impact I tried to talk him out of it but I knew he was very very strong he believed in it so much and so I went against my own belief and I said okay Tony I said but it can't be long range it has to be for a short period of time he agreed Came into, uh, I helped him, you know, he came into Pittsburgh where they had the tri state wrestling at the time, where it's between the part of Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio. And he came in as the Batman, but as the time came, he had to take it off because that was the agreement, and he did. You know, one of the things I. Like the I, whole Batman costume, like the superhero? Yeah. That's the mask with the ears wearing. and the cape? Excuse me? The cape and everything? Yeah, he, well, that's what he would come in the ring with. Then he would take the cape off, of course, 
but he would maintain the uh, the the Batman outfit. Yeah, yeah. The um, I was gonna bring up something totally different, which is uh, kind of about uh, lifting and powerlifting and things like that. There was an article in a in a Muscle magazine that I read, I think, was about two months ago. I'm guessing um, where they listed. It was very interesting. They listed like uh, the strongest men who ever lived. And um, you were on that, they had about 20 names, um, you know, guys that you would be familiar with. I'm not sure how many of our listeners would, you know, like the Douglas Hepburns and the Paul Andersons of that era and oh, yeah. people, you know, Bill Kazmaier and, oh. you know, people from the current era. And you you were on that list. And, you know, one of the things they were doing was, uh, like, comparing lifts at the times and things like that. And the author said that uh, if you were doing what the guys today were doing, that he had no doubt that you would be bench pressing more than 700 pounds. Well, if I had been on the, you mean the steroids and that? I mean, steroids and bench shirt was what he was, and 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 uh, the, you know the supplementation that the guys do and, yeah. and and things like that was what he was talking about. Yeah. Well, you see, Dave, you have to understand something too. That when I got into professional wrestling, uh, I had achieved my lifts at, at that age because once you got in wrestling and you start banging your elbows and you start banging this and that, your lifts aren't going to go up. You know, they're going to come down. So I honestly believe, I've always felt in my heart anyway, that if I had not gone into professional wrestling, if I had had the right job that allowed me the proper, you know, instead of, because remember, I was a construction worker before I turned pro. So it wasn't easy working eight, ten hours a day construction and then going to the gym at night and pump iron. Or, or, or. So anyway, I got up to like, you know, I did 565 on a, on a bench press, and I did it with a two-second pause on the chest. You weren't allowed to use elbow pads or anything that later on guys start using. You know, I did over 700 pounds in a squat and deadlift and what have you. Now, I did this all prior to my 23rd birthday. Now, you don't reach your peak in powerlifting until you're in your about, your, you know, 33, 34, and maybe even up to 35. That's for powerlifting. For Olympic lifting, I think you would peak out by the, by the age of 33, although we had guys that, that did phenomenal after 30. 536, but those were rare cases. I believe that if I had a better job than what I had and had not gone into wrestling to, you know, bang up the elbows and back and all that stuff, I, I honestly believe that without the drugs, I would have gotten up to around 650 or better on the bench. Wow. Nobody was done. doing. Excuse me. Nobody was doing that in that era, were they? No. When I did 565, nobody was doing it. Yeah. You know, wow. not 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 really. Well, well. Let me take it back. Uh, uh, let me take it back. Uh, Doug Epburn of Canada, uh, he was doing, uh, he was around that range, but he had done 550. But in all fairness to him, he was spending a lot of time with the Olympic lifting and not as much on the power lift, uh, for example, as I was. I was spending much less time on my Olympic lifting than I was on my power lifting. Uh, I did both, but, and I competed in both, but I, I had... Uh, I, I was more of a, uh, I don't know, what do you want to call it, a natural or had more drive or whatever in my power lifting. Uh, so, uh, you know, but uh, but, Doug, but there was a little difference, too. Doug Edburn was a 350-pound guy. When I'm doing these things, you know, I'm at about 260, 265, and, and 270. Now, what do you work out like nowadays? Excuse me? I think, what do you yeah, work out like nowadays? Are you still doing any of those lifts? What I do now, what I do now is I work out every day. Well, I, with, uh, for example, I work out a lot with the uh, dumbbells, and uh, uh, you, you know dumbbell bench pressing, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Okay, I'm not strong or anything like I was, anything, but I can still go up to the hundred pound dumbbells, and I do really? sets of eights with them. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I'm 65. I'm going to be 66 years old, and I still uh, and I still do curls with the 55s and 60 pound dumbbells. So I mean, you know, I, I, I hope I all of our listeners are embarrassed. Well, no, I mean, I don't, but yeah, I'm but... So, I'm, I'm sorry I'm laughing because it's like, you've, I mean, you've got to be a very strong 30-year-old to do those weights. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, but I used, anyway, to, go ahead. I used to use the 100-pounders for curls years ago. <laughs> dumbbells. Each, dumbbell for dumbbell curls. I used to use 100-pounders. Oh, that's pounds just on scaring me. You know, but I do the 100 pounds I do for, for dumbbell bench press. I use the 90-pounders for laterals, you know, flies on a, on a flat bench. And dumbbells, but then I do a uh, uh, lot of other stuff with the machine. I have a, a universal machine here. And then on the next day, since I don't run much, because running, because of my bad back, uh, my uh, orthopedic surgeons told me that uh, I should uh, not run and do the bike instead. So I do the bike a minimum of one hour, but more times than 
not, I'd go up this ice uh, an hour and a half each time, and and then I would I would do full exercise, like you know, different kind of uh, leg raises, leg extension, crisscross, all kind of stuff that's not only good for the abs, but it's uh, it's good for for the back when you have a bad back. And so I one day it's strictly aerobic, and another day it's mostly dumbbell, and then I do some exercise with the machine. Who are some of the stronger guys that you've come across, whether it be in re- wrestling or in the gym? Like uh, I'm just thinking of a guy like say Ken Patera, who was came a little bit after you, but was also phenomenally strong. And um, I don't know, maybe Paul Anderson, some of those type of guys. I mean, how would you rate uh, their strength? And were there any wrestlers that were that you know you would know about that were actually phenomenally strong, but maybe not never got the credit because they never competed as powerlifters? Well, did you ever hear of a guy, unfortunately, he got killed in Minnesota. He was in a, an accident. He was with, riding the car with Red Bestine. And they went oh, Hercules best. Cortez. Who? Hercules Romero. Yeah, Hercules I, Cortez. I was going to say Pepe Chichero. I knew him as Pepe That's Chichero. That's his real name, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he was a strong guy. Uh, he wasn't uh, like a great uh, Olympic lifter or, or even all-around power lifter because he didn't like squats and his legs didn't match the rest of his body. But he was a good bench presser. I think he got up to around 500 pounds on a bench. And I'm not sure because I never worked out with him, so I'm not sure what other lifts he could do. But I did hear of him benching uh, 500 uh, or so. And so that was a uh, keep, keep in mind, too, uh, uh, guys, David and Brian, that, that a lot of guys – that you mention nowadays, and I'm not going to get into that because I like some of these people. You mentioned Kaz Meyer and different guys. But remember, too, that when you talk about some of these people, some of these people, you're talking about the guys who were uh, drug users. By drug users, you know, they're, they're steroids. Well, I mean, my all of, I mean, pretty much all the world-class lifters, it's just it's almost considered a given now. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm saying. So, so when you mix those few of us who never touched that stuff versus those who were on it and on it pretty good, well, you know, then uh, maybe we uh, in, in, we weren't rated right up with them, but we were out down. Keep in mind that they, not only did they use that stuff, but they also, the size, you know, some of these guys were 300, 350 pounds, 375. That helps, too, because uh, that added body weight, uh, uh, you know, is, is, is strength. So uh, to me, uh, you know, I, I, you know, just like this weightlifting thing that I was uh, Honored recently. What they try to do is they they look back at, at, at yesterday and find out the guys and then they do pretty good uh, homework as to uh, who might have done uh, some drugs or not. And there are lifters who have tremendous uh, uh, who have done good good lifting and they will not uh, they will not honor them because they know for a fact that they were using these drugs and they, so they will not honor them. Hmm. We, let's, let's go to the phone calls. We've got a full bank of calls. We're going to start with Charles in Connecticut. Charles, what's going on? How you doing? Uh, how you doing, Bruno? I'm uh, fine, Charles. How are you? Yeah, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Well, thank you. Uh, I want to know um, um, when, when Vince started, um, what you thought when Vince started uh, buying up all the territories and he started uh, you know, expanding he, he nationally. Didn't buy too, he didn't buy too many territories. I think the only one he actually <laughs> bought was Stu. He bought Stu Hart's. For a million dollars, paid him a hundred thousand, and never paid him the other nine hundred. So Stu never actually got the rest of his money until uh, a couple months ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Bought or took over. Okay. He took, uh, o- he took uh, over. I knew right away that that oh, was. Oh, well, he, he he did buy he did buy uh, his father's territory. Also, I should say that. Yeah. But anyway, or however that worked. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead, Bruno. <laughs> well, I was around at the time, so I know a little <laughs> bit about that too. But anyway, the point is that what did I think of it? I thought. This is going to be uh, a losing uh, situation for the wrestlers. You have to understand something, that in those days when you had so many different territories, uh, uh, the wrestlers, uh, in my opinion, they had it made in the sense that that uh, if you uh, um, if you weren't happy uh, in a particular territory because maybe you'd been there a little too long and maybe the promoters felt that the best of you you know had been used and you're more or less uh, now have to play second, third, and fourth uh, banana on the, on, the, uh, on you know on the territory. You were free then to make your contacts and move on and so forth. And, and a lot of times, like I remember guys. Uh, that I wrestled in New York, for example, whether it be uh, Koloff or whether it be Tamako, whether it be Bill Miller, Don Leo Jonathan, they, these people, you know, would get the great publicity for having wrestled here. There, and they were they had no problem uh, when they were, let's say, done in that particular area to move on to other areas and uh, 
and and remain headliners and, and be fresh in, a, in 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 you know in other territories. And those guys that weren't necessarily headliners, they still could move on from territory to territory and always be employed and always you know uh, hope, you know do okay. Uh, what happened when he started doing that? For one thing, I believed and I said at the time that uh, seeing the direction that he was going, a lot of these territories eventually would die. And there would no longer be uh, uh, territories, but maybe eventually it would. And I made that prediction to the guys at the time who thought that what McMahon was doing uh, was great and it was going to be, wow, you know, for those of us who work for him, we're, boy, we're going to be wrestling all over the country and all the arenas everywhere. I said, well, you're going to find that uh, a lot of these places are going to, uh, to, to fold. And, uh, and and eventually it'll be to where uh, either if he succeeds he'll be the only one. Uh, of course, when Ted Turner bought uh, you know the NWA, I felt that with uh, the power you know the, the money power that they had that he could uh, stand up to McMahon and be a force. Which eventually, of course, as we all know, they were the two the you know the the, the WCW and the WWF. But it did away with all the territories and look at. What's happened since? Yes, it's true. Some of the guys are making money, like guys like uh, uh, myself and people in my time would never have imagined that uh, people could make. At least I, I'm going by what I, what I'm told that they make anyway. But by the same token, look how many guys uh, are out of work or, or these independents that they, you know really are not putting them down, but they're really Mickey Mouse stuff. Whereas in the days of the territories, maybe. Maybe nobody made the million dollars or millions of dollars a year, but I'll tell you, everybody was making a darn good living, and everybody stayed employed, and and everybody could move from one territory to another, and 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 it was just, in my opinion, that that was still the best system. Yeah, I know you don't watch any wrestling today, but what are what are the um, like some contemporary wrestlers that you like, like from the '80s or the early '90s or whatever? Uh I, when he first came out, and I do mean when he first came out before he became what he is now, I thought that Scott Steiner looked, uh, uh, and I'm not talking about his physical appearance, I thought his, uh, his work in a ring. Uh, I, when I first saw him a good while ago, I can't remember if it was maybe 1990, I, I don't remember the year, but I oh, thought yeah, he looked very, very good. The way he was uh, moving and so forth, and I, 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 you know, that of course I'm impressed with guys like uh, this Benoit. I think this this guy is, is very impressive with the, his work in the ring. I think uh, Malenko. I think the, you know, and there are a lot of other guys that I don't even know. I, I you know, because like I say, from then I never I haven't watched in such a long, long time. But there there were a lot of guys that. Uh, that I thought were very impressive in, uh, in, in the things they could do. Now, I, what I'm not impressed with, not that I, my God, that I could ever have done any of it, but these acrobatic guys, uh, that doesn't impress me. Not that it doesn't impress me that it's a heck of a talent to be able to do that, but it doesn't impress me to have that in wrestling. I, I just, I don't like that in wrestling. To me, that's not wrestling. When you had an individual many years ago who did some of that acrobatic stuff, like a rock uh, or a Carpentier, there was some, you know, there was just one or two guys. But now, you know, some of these guys with their triple somersaults and quadruple front flips, whatever they do, it, there's so much of it and so many of them that to me it's, it, it's, it's completely taken away from wrestling. Anything else, Charles? Oh, what about um, Hulk Hogan or Ric Flair? No, as far as Ric Flair, uh, Ric Flair was always a talented guy, a very hard worker, uh, uh, very talented. I just feel the only negative I say about Flair was that as the years went on and on and on, he became very routinish about, uh, you could almost predict uh, uh, everything he was going to do. And when you get like that, well, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, and as far as Hogan, well, let's forget about it. I mean, when you mention Flair and Hogan, let's not even mention the same two in the same breath. I, I never saw Hogan as any kind of a talent. I'm sorry, but uh, it's just the way I feel. I, I, you know, he, he was just a guy. He was, he's a big guy. He looked great due to the aid of uh, some chemicals. But as far as uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, to, to suggest that he was a, a great uh, guy in that ring, no, I, I never thought that. Bruno, yes, we, sir. Have a, we have a bunch of questions here. Uh, this is the story is about Zabisco again. Um, is it true? I remember when, when I was a kid, this was the story. And I mean, how accurate is the story that Larry Zabisco basically walked over to your house, introduced himself, and said that he wanted to be a wrestler? 
he, he, he lived in a neighborhood, okay, and he used to be a fan of mine, I, I found out later. And he was a kid. He was uh, uh, just uh, like uh, in first year of high school. And uh, he was on a wrestling team. He had joined the wrestling team there. And he used to somehow, boy, he was spooky, like he knew when I was coming home. And in those days, I'd come home maybe, you know, twice a month or something like that because they had me on a go so much. That is in my first reign, you know, with the, those eight, eight years. And then he, he would come to me and say, you know, he was very polite. says, Mr. Sam Martino, he said, you know, I... I'd like to be a wrestler someday and blah, blah, blah. And, he said, and I said to him, well, what are you doing now? You're going to squeeze his, I, he said, yes. I said, are you wrestling in school? He said, yeah. I said, well, keep up and be the best you can be in high school. I said, and after high school, I said, you know, uh, you should think of college. I said, and then, uh, if you want to go into professional wrestling, I said, you know, but get your education and all that. Well, he would keep coming over and every time, like, I'd, uh, I'd come home almost, you know, and later as he got, uh, uh, older uh, he uh, sometimes one would like to take a little workout and, and I'd work out with him a little bit if, if I was going to be home for a little bit and uh, and and the guy got to like him you know I, he was doing very very well with his wrestling in school and that and so when it came time for he graduated from uh, 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 high school his parents came to me his mother actually and said you know he really looks up to you and we want him to go to college he has to go to college but he wants to be a professional wrestler he says we, you know he won't listen to us please if you talk to him uh, I think he might listen to you so I, I had a talk with him and I told him I says look you go to college I says, and if you go to college and you graduate from college, I promise you I will help you get into wrestling if you still would like to get into professional wrestling. I said, but if you don't go to college, I said, no, I'm not going to lift a finger for you because I said, you, you, you live to regret not, not getting that education. Very reluctantly, he he, uh, he did, and his parents, of course, were, were were very very happy. And I must say, he did go to college. But in my thoughts, I thought, well, you know, he's getting older, goes to college, he's going to major in something, and uh, you know, maybe he'll uh, you know get a good job. In other words, he, he's, he's, he'll change his mind and forget about wrestling. But boy, he never did. And so after he uh, graduated from college. Heck, I got a phone call, I think, before his folks did, that he said that he had, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean it, that he, got, he did it, and now he was looking for me to keep my word. And then, then of course, I did. I, I helped him uh, to get into wrestling. I worked out with him whenever I had the opportunity, because I was wrestling around here at time now and then, so I would meet with him, work out with him. And uh, then I, I helped them get into, uh, like, uh, in Oklahoma and Fort, Portland, Oregon, smaller territories, you know, to get the experience. And eventually uh, we brought them around to New York. Now, you also, um, your son David, yeah. uh, wrestled. And that was, uh, you were very reluctant about that one. In fact, uh, you, you discouraged him from doing it. And your other sons, um, did any of them, you know, because of who their father was, want to get into wrestling? Because none of, because the other sons did, uh, did not get into wrestling. Yeah, uh, David, I did my best, to, not just to discourage wrestling. I wanted him to go to college, and I did like with Zabisco. I says, look, if you go to college, I will. If you still want to go into professional wrestling, but if you have that education behind you, I said, you know, you know, because he coming from the old country and that, I, I, I was a strong, strong believer because. I never did. See, I was offered a scholarship at the University of Pittsburgh, but it was a year-per-year -year scholarship. I had to prove myself both wrestling-wise and academically to go to the second year. And to be perfectly honest with you, uh, I, I was scared of it uh, because uh, high school wasn't easy for me. You have to understand, when I came to this country, I couldn't speak a word of English. So, you know, and then I used to hear those guys up at the Pittfield House, that's uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, where we used to work out. They used to say, how about, oh, man, this guy would say, I've been up till 4 o'clock in the morning studying, oh, it was so tough. And I thought, my God, if it's hard for these people, what what chance have I got, you know, to, to uh, you know, academically, I just had no confidence. And my dad at the time knew this Italian carpenter, uh, um, a contractor who could get me in the union as an apprentice carpenter, and and I, and I chose that way because I honestly didn't believe I didn't have the faith that I could uh, cut it. But but you know that was my thing because I came from a foreign country and it was this language thing and all that. But my sons, if there's one thing I wanted and I wanted very very badly was for them to get that education because I, I'm one of those who believes that if you get an education that you can always you get, your chances of making out in life are, are much better than those who don't. And so, but with David, I had no luck. He uh, he said, if you don't help me, he says, I'll do it on my own. And, and he did it on his own because I did not 
work out or train or anything with him. He got other people to work out with him, and I wasn't even aware of it at the time. And before I knew it, uh, you know, he got somebody, one of the... Uh, to to fix him up to uh, go to uh, where do you go Puerto Rico for for months and months and and anyway that's how he got into it but no not against my wishes my other two guys they wrestled in school uh, one of them was a pretty good uh, pitcher in, in, he was a very good pitcher but he messed up his elbow and then he uh, went into track and he started throwing the javelin but he had a very very strong arm and in fact uh, even with uh, the messed up uh, Elbow. He, he, they just had him in the paper. They, they went back 15 years of some records that were set in the school for track and so forth, and they had him for his record still hasn't been broken for the uh, javelin throw. He threw around 210 feet or something like that, and it still stands 15 years later in, in, in the high school. But when, then he started wrestling too. And, and uh, but this first professional wrestling guy, I told him, I said, you know, get that education, forget professional wrestling. And then, in all honesty, uh, guys, uh, as they saw how the wrestling uh, changed and so forth and so on. That in itself, I think, uh, uh, kind of changed their minds as well. I don't think that they wanted to be in it. Not I'm not saying that they necessarily uh, would have had the opportunity to get in it. <laughs> because once McMahon uh, became a big uh, guy and uh, my situation in him, you know, I doubt very much if he would, would have been that anxious to... Uh, to, you know, to have my my sons wrestle for him, but uh, I think they change their mind on their own, and they just uh, and they just uh, they you know they still work out. In fact, one of the guys he still likes to work out on a mat with another kid he graduated with from Slippery Rock University, and they still go on the, and work out on a mat a couple of days a week. They uh, work out with the weights first, and then they go work out on a mat. But uh, but they have their jobs, and then and, and that's it. No 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 wrestling. Okay, before we go back to the calls, I just want to answer two quick questions here. This is from Hector, who goes, On behalf of the chat room, I would like to ask you what is a BA. That's when you pull your pants down, bare ass. This is something I mentioned earlier in the show. And this is from Sean Keyes, who was at SmackDown last night. The whole chat said, room didn't know that one? Can you believe that, Brian? Shame on you guys. I know. Didn't, weren't you ever in high school? Anyway, last night at SmackDown, they bleeped out the Big Show's interview. So, Brian, that tells you what he said, doesn't it? Yep, he um, did. Yep. Oh, well. When they showed the scene again, and he goes, uh, Brock Lesnar and Shelton Benjamin look like stars. Lesnar's scary looking, and Benjamin is a lot bigger than I thought. Plus, he had really cool ring gear on. They were the highlight of the show for me, and can you believe there was no Stephanie? She must not have written that show. Actually, she did. Or partially <laughs> did. Wait till you see China before her match looking at, in the mirror. It made me sick. Oh, boy. Oh, I guess it's something else to look forward to here. Um, this is from Alan in New York, who uh, said that, uh, I have a question for Bruno. I know that you worked on uh, numerous occasions for All Japan Pro Wrestling. Actually, well, he, he did work for All Japan, but he worked for the old group in the 60s a lot, too. Last yeah. June, uh, Mitsuhara Misawa, who was uh, Baba's uh, number one wrestler, split and formed, took 90% of the wrestlers and, and everything. Did you, do, you, do, you, do you follow, like, basically what happened there with uh, Misawa taking everyone from All Japan and, and what your opinion is of, of that? You mean what's going on now? Uh, what happened? Yeah, what's going on now with uh, All Japan and Noah's? I, I haven't the slightest idea what's going on now. I really don't. When I went to Japan for for that tribute that they did for Shohei Baba, I had been told at the time when I was there that uh, his wife was going to take over. And then I heard later from somebody, I'm not even sure who from, that a lot of the wrestlers had taken off. And uh, and and uh, I, recently, uh, Stan Hansen. Uh, 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 told me I, I, and he wanted to send me a, a photo. He wanted to send me a photo showing how I broke my neck. And, uh, that he <laughs> oh, got, nice. your head going straight down, yeah. Yeah, he wanted to show me that, and and uh, he, he was telling me that she was still uh, she was still struggling to carry on. But I really know nothing of what's going on in Japan. Do you remember um, this question asking about Baba and also Jumbo Saruta? Uh, do you have any thoughts about those two guys? Did I ever what? Uh, thoughts about it. I know Bob, I know you knew Baba very very well. Oh, um, very Jumbo well. Saruta also. I mean, you, yeah, you would have you would have. Let me tell you about. Uh, let me tell you something quick today that you might be interested in. When Baba and Dinaki uh, uh, were still together, you know, the same organization. Yeah, that's the sixties. Yeah, and then they were going. Inaki was going to go on his own. What happened was it was, was a tag team match in Osaka with me and uh, Dominic Danucci against uh, Baba and uh, and. Uh, Inaki, and Inaki, uh, uh, because I was one of the guys, I'm not going to tell you I was the only guy by any means, but for God's sakes, but I was one of the top guys over there. That I, I used to do very good business when I wrestled Bob Burns, uh, and that's who I usually wrestled. Uh, and, 
And anyway, Inaki, uh, because uh, he and I never hit it off, uh, <laughs> he just never did. So he tried to pull a little double cross uh, in, in, in that particular match because he, uh, Baba, poor guy, didn't even know what was going on that Inaki was was uh, was leaving. This is like a bit of a little bit of a double cross. It was hard to understand all the politics of it all over there because of the language barrier. You just knew that they, something was going on, but I really wasn't sure. So I'm in the ring, and Baba, try, I mean Inaki, tried to cross me. He had been working out with Dutch some. And he tried to cross me to beat me so that uh, uh, I guess they were going to use it for pub public. Oh, so he had a pinfall on you because very few people did, right? Yeah. Excuse me? So he was going to try to get a pinfall on you yeah. because very few people got, yeah. Yeah, well, he tried. And then when I saw what was going on and I saw that, you know, well, then I fought him off and I got I got off of him. And uh, anyway, make a long story short, I, I hooked him with a front face lock and almost broke his damn neck. But uh, uh, he managed to, you know, because we were by that corner, he tagged Baba. Then he never came back in the ring for the rest of the match. But I told Joey Gucci, I said, something is going on. I said, I don't speak your language or anything. I said, but you better tell Baba to better to to, to be careful. Something is happening here. And then I came back after the thing was over, and I found out then that he had, uh, you know, that they, you know, that they had split, and uh, Inaki had formed his own organization. One quick thing, and then we're going to start going to the phone calls. This is from Garen Shea, who was also at the TV tapings last night in Nashville, who said, I've got a couple of observations. He goes, I did not hear one person cheering for Steve Austin. The turn has finally worked. He goes, I was very impressed with Randy Orton. The crowd even applauded Japanese style after his match. Uh, that's uh, Bob Orton. Bruno, you would know uh, his grandfather, Bob Orton Sr. Oh, yes, I wrestled just, Bob Orton many times. Yeah, just his uh, grandson just started wrestling uh, oh. just in the last couple months. He's so who well. would he be? Uh, Bob, he's Bob Jr.'s son, oh, the okay. one who wrestled in the WWF, yeah. Oh. And uh, he goes, at a time when WCW can only afford to have positive a buildup, I think they were really buried last night. And we'll have to watch how that turns out. Hmm. Uh, let's go to David in Nebraska. David, what's going on? Hi, Bruno. Yes, sir. I tell you, it is an honor and a privilege to get to speak with you. I grew up in Boston, and oh. you were my hero growing up. You really were. Well, thank you very kindly. You know, when I was a kid, we used to have a cat, this Catholic priest, Brother Bob Russell, who used to take us to the garden every month. And, uh, you know, I just wish there was something like that that, that was still available. Something that, you know, I could take a kid to and, and, and not be embarrassed or by. Or a priest. <laughs> <laughs> what was that, Bri? A priest. <laughs> or a think priest. about that. Yeah, yeah. think about that. That's right. You know, it's it's just, you know, the it, it's really a shame to, to see what's happened with the sport. I mean, I you know, I'm trying to get into Japanese wrestling, and the language is, it seems to be stopping me. Oh, and it's also three years too late. Yeah. You know, I, I, really I mean, I, mean I, I still, I still like it, but I mean, it, it just the, the guys are really banged up there. They worked a very hard style, and the younger guys just aren't ready for the spots. And it's, um, it's kind of like one of those in between periods. There, it's not, it's not really very good. I don't say it's not very good, but it's, it's not what it once was. But it's better than what we've got here right now, Dave. I, I really it's, do it's believe different. that. It's different. I, I mean, there's, there's, I, I don't want to knock the guys because I think that the guys in the ring are very, very good. You know, I mean, you know, but everyone's got their, you know. You know, ideas of taste, and you know, I, I mean, I can see why people don't like it. And I mean, hey, you know, I, you know, my girlfriend's younger brother is a big wrestling fan, and there's a lot of times when, uh, you know, there's stuff on where I'm just going like, you know, I, I don't want him. Or, you know, there's times where you don't want him watching it because you don't know what you're going to see. You know, they're they're not. To me, one of the things I don't like about WWF is that they know what their audience is, but they're not responsive to it, and then they wash their hands and say that's not our audience when they know full well it is. A lot of the stuff they do, you know, it, it, if they didn't have a kid's audience, it wouldn't, it wouldn't bother me so much. But they know they do, and then they try to say they, that, oh, we don't market to kids. And it's like when they start saying that, you're just going like, wait a minute. Now, come on. Don't even my Vince is talking about everybody watches SmackDown. It's the most, uh, most watched show among families. And then talking about, uh, you know, showing clips of everything on that show. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I just think it's a shame. Bruno, I've got a, two questions for you. First one being, when I was a kid, I got a whole bunch of pictures of you. I got a couple with Ken Patera and a couple of you just, you know, coming out of the ring and all. Is there like a P.O. box or somewhere that I could mail something to you to have you autograph it? It's amazing you don't have my address because I get mail every single day from people 
sending me photos to sign or requesting them. I don't know where they get my address, but uh, I thought maybe it was in, in these uh, internet or someplace. I don't know. Probably. I, I, you know, I'd be happy to do that, but obviously I'm not. I can't give my address over the phone. Right. That's why I was hoping that you had a. Uh, no, I don't. Like I really a don't. Uh, PO box or something. Oh well, I'll I'll find that one eventually, as most people do. The other question is, in in Luthez's book, Hooker. Yeah. He really wasn't real kind to you. Well, you know, I'm glad you mentioned it because I want to tell Dave before we get off. There's a couple of points I would really would like to clear up that okay. I think is very important. If you, if you if you can allow me a, a couple of minutes. Oh, please do. Okay. And I, maybe you can listen, and, uh, and then I'll tell you what about that. Okay. Let's okay. do that right now. Yeah, let's do it right now. Do it right now? Yeah, okay. sure. Uh, Dave, I know that you interviewed him, and, and I'm not faulting you uh, that because you basically, at least from what I'm told and what was read to me, what what uh, Thes told you, and I wish that I had given I had been given the opportunity to give my side. But let me tell you the facts, and these are the facts. Uh, what happened was that the WWF, we were going really strong. I mean, I was getting, Vince McMahon was getting requests from NWA territories for my services. I used to go to, I went to Tennessee for Nick Goulas, worked both Memphis and Nashville. I used to go to Florida for uh, Miami for Chris Dundee, and then I went to, to uh, St. Petersburg, all, all, all over the place. And so what happened was that in a national, in a national uh, the convention that they used to have every year for wrestling, they usually used, used to hold it in Vegas. Vince McMahon and, Phil Ma and uh, Sam Machinick got together, so forth and so on about all the, you know, the, 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 what 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 was he doing? There was, you know, that that set everything on fire so much, so forth and so on. During that uh, during that meeting, they had conversation about unifying the title, and okay, so. The, the problem then came, as they start having meetings on doing this, was the dates. Sam Moshnick needed 15 days a month of, of the champion. Vince McMahon couldn't do with, he, he had to have 17 days. They had, uh -oh, we're, we're getting into trouble now. Yeah, they, <laughs> they had all these meetings. I was never in any of the meetings, I must say. I heard that this was in one of them, true or not, I don't know, but that's what I was told. Anyway, bottom line. What happened was that this was the, the big thing. In those days, I was working every day because two days a month I used to go for Frank Tani to Maple Leaf Garden because when I left, when I left Frank Tani, he was such an honorable man, a man that I really respected and liked. When he asked me if I would come in, I sacrificed those two Sundays to go home with my family to keep my word with, with Frank because I really liked Frank. But it, it, it was becoming too much. When a guy named Phil Zacko, whether you guys who know him or not, knew him or mm -hmm. not, he was with Vince McMahon and Toots Monk. He, he, he and I were good friends, and he told me on a Thursday where we used to go to Washington to do the TV, and he said to me, he says, you know, he said, they're fighting over these days. I don't know why they want to do that. And He said, you know, we're doing so great. Why do we need to get involved with this? You know, thinking, and I said, well, what's going on with that? He says, well, and he told me the story about the meetings, and they were debating over the dates. So I got a little angry because all this stuff was going on, and I was completely excluded. So I, so I went in, I told Vince McMahon and Toots Mom that I wanted to have a meeting with him. So we went to the Vince McMahon had like three rooms in his office. We went in there and I said, look, I understand that, that you guys are negotiating, but the dates are a problem, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I don't care who gets what dates. I said, but let me make one thing perfectly clear. I said, I'm, I'm going to talk to Frank Tommy, and as much as I care about Frank, but I need those two Sundays that I'm giving up. For my home, for my family, I have a wife and I have a kid. My mom and dad are getting old. I said I'm going to take all four Sundays or mine. The other days, whether whether it's 26 or 27, depending on 30 or 31 day month, I says I don't care how you guys split them up, whichever way you want. I don't care. I said, but I want to make it clear because before you guys agree on who gets 15 days and who gets uh, 16 days or whatever, uh, then then I'm going to be in the middle because I'm not going to do it. So I said, so when you figure out who gets how many days, I said, remember, the four Sundays are off. Fritz Mond right there said, see, Vince, he, he said, see, I, I, I told you from the beginning, this is a stupid idea. He says, why do we want you? Well, Fritz told me later, it was a bit of an ego thing for McMahon. He wanted his guy to be the one and only champion. Which uh, 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 so anyway, when when these four days were eliminated, 
then it was problems because now instead of working with uh, 31 days or 30 days from now, they had to work with, say, 26. And, and, and it, Vince McMahon absolutely would not do for less than, than uh, 17 days uh, because of all these major arenas and all that. And so then the thing was put to a halt. I've been hearing all these stories, and I understand that you may have wrote about it too, Dave, was that Fez was demanding $100,000, and that a year later that the title was switched back. You know how stupid and ludicrous that is? First of all, why would McMahon consider going after one year to give Fez the title back? Why would he want to do that? What the, Fez isn't the guy that they could use in New York. That wasn't the few times they tried him. He never did anything over there. So Vince would never go for that. And $100,000? Gee whiz, after the deal fell through, who did he lose the title to? Gene Kaninsky. Did he get $100,000? And did a year later, did Gene Kaninsky give him the title back? That was such hogwash. I put the kibosh to the deal because of the days that they, that they each one were demanding when I told them that Sundays are mine and that's it. And, and then they had less days to work with and that's what broke that deal. Nothing else. Because Fez, unfortunately, he may have been great in the 30s and the 40s. I don't know if he's so record. Obviously, he must have been very well as far as an attraction in that because he was champion six, seven uh, times. But when it came to the 60s, Fess had his days, his good days behind him because I was in Toronto and, and I seen him when he came up there. In fact, that's another thing. He says that in, in an interview he did recently, he said that what a coup Mc, uh, Frank pulled because he got McMahon because they were friends to first give Rogers and then to give me, in other words, to, 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 to wrestle Fez in Toronto. Well, that's, that's insane. When I wrestled Fez in Toronto, I was working for Frank Tunney in Toronto. And Frank Tunney asked me, he says, look, Bruno, he said, uh, I'm, uh, you know, I have to use Stas X amount of times because he's NWA champion. He says, and, and look, look at, he says, uh, you know, you know, it, it's, it's not been drawing. It's been disasters every time he comes up here. He says, you're my top guy right now. I'd like to make a match w with you and him and we'll work something out where nobody gets hurt. He says, but he's the champ and blah, blah, blah. I said, fine, Frank. I said, that, that's, that's fine. No problem. So, that's what we did. It was like a double pin thing. I thought I won. He thought he won. Referee raised his hand. Fez was the winner. Fine. That was it. I mean, he said that that uh, Frank brought me from New York. If he had brought me from New York, I would have been the champion because when I went back to New York, a short time thereafter, I got the belt from Rogers. Do you understand? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, 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 it's ludicrous. It's insane. I don't understand where, where this guy is telling these stories. It, it's just no truth to them whatsoever. This $100,000 demand, I'll do respect. He was in no position to demand anything because he wasn't getting the job done anymore. He just wasn't drawing anything anywhere, and that's why they, were, they wanted to get rid of him. Now, they respected him. I'm not going to make it sound like get rid of him like he was an old shoe, but he just... They did, just didn't want him in that spot anymore because he just wasn't getting the job done. He just wasn't drawing anymore anywhere. And then he said that uh, after he did that with Rogers and me, that that really closed the doors for him in New York. Gee whiz, that hadn't been in New York since 51 because he drew the worst gate ever with, when he wrestled Rock in New York. I mean, I'm not putting the guy down, but my God, he tells these ridiculous tales. They're so outrageous, and there's no truth to them. And I don't understand that if it's his mind, really, he believes that nonsense. He says there was even a bond that had been put up for Rogers and me in Toronto, and if we didn't go through with the match, we would have lost the money. What in the heck is he talking about? I never no, there, was, there, was, there was one with there was one with Rogers because it was the NWA well, title with bond. Rogers because the title was involved. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, but not yeah, with no. me. I never heard with you. Well, that's what he told the Den guy, Den Rosinski, whatever his name is, from South Carolina. But he well, said, one thing. I came from New York to wrestle him. I was working for Frank Tunney when I wrestled him. Okay. You didn't know no. that? For, you didn't know that, Dave? I mean, I basically, you, I mean, I, I, you know, I, you, were, you were just about to go to New York. I, I'm trying to remember the time frame, but this was early 63. When this was all going down. Yeah, but at the time when I wrestled Fez, I had no clue what was going to happen in New York because when Vince finally contacted me, I don't want no part of New York because of the bad memories that I had there. And then I, I, I made certain demands on him, and then finally when everything was agreed upon, then, I, then when I went to New York, in a short time thereafter, wrestled Rogers for the title. 
But, you know, uh, that was after the test. Thank you. Do you think that if I was going to be champion in New York, that I would, I would even have agreed to wrestle Fez and, uh, and lose a match? I wouldn't have even agreed to it because that wouldn't have done me good for what was about to happen. But at the time when I wrestled Fez, I didn't even have a clue that I was going to be a champion with, uh, in, in New York. Didn't have a clue at the time. This came up pretty fast when they started contact because New York was dead. Rogers had literally taken the territory. Believe me, it was a disaster. McMahon was practically in bankruptcy. And Tutsman and he were, were, were feuding a little bit because McMahon said, you know, Look at the successes guys have in Canada, and says well, we had him here all the, all the time. But you want to stick with this guy who's killed so many territories in the past, and now he's done this one in as well. So they were feeding over that, and finally, because McMahon and I weren't even talking, they went to a guy named Dave Freeman to contact me. I told Freeman if McMahon wants to talk to me, let him call me. So finally, McMahon did, and then when he wanted me to just to come back, he was offering me a, a, a guarantee week. I says no, there's only one way I'll come back, and that's with uh, you know, and the thing with Rod. And, and that all came about quickly, like. But at the time I wrestled fast, I didn't have a clue that that uh, that that was going to happen. And I repeat, I was working for Frank Tunney when I wrestled fast, not Vince McMahon. So I don't know where he, I don't know why he tells these things. They're, they're outrageous. Anyway, that's it. Okay. One thing I just want to ask me, and we got to run a break real quick. In the thing in the mid '60s, you know, where they were going to unify the title and everything. Yes. To pacify him, and you know, you know, wrestling. I don't think it's inconceivable that they went to him and go, Lou, if you lose this match, we'll give it back to you a year later. Whether whether that year later would ever come or not is another story, but you know, that's not that's not exactly uncommon in wrestling either. Okay, that's possible. But you know why I don't that believe was... that? Because okay. I think Mushnik respected Lou and I don't think he would have given him a con job like that. I don't believe that. Well, no, you but, may, but it's may very well be right. Yeah, huh? you you may very well run on that. Wes, Wes, how are you today? Hi guys, how's it going? Real good. Uh, Brenda, it's nice to talk to you. I wanted to ask you in regards to Stan Hansen and the neck injury. Did you think at that time that you would be able to come back, considering you know how medicine was at the time, uh, you know from such a serious injury? And also, uh, what do you think of Hansen's work? Uh, you know, it was a little bit different at that time period, you know, with the roughhouse style. Yeah. Um, uh, well, the doctors told me more than likely I would not come back. Okay, but I, I somehow I didn't believe that. I. I was always a fanatic with my training and everything else, and I, I, don't, I know somebody might say, so what? But so what? The better condition you're in, the better shape you're in, the, the more desire, unless it's a, a situation to where you're paralyzed, which I became within a millimeter of being paralyzed from the neck down. But I, I didn't. So, uh, no, they, they, they thought that the chances were against it, but I guess I fooled them because I did come back. As far as Stan Hansen, uh, you know, when I wrestled him back uh, then, uh, I thought I had some fairly good matches with Stan, but obviously he was a very young guy, and as time went on, he got better and better. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I, I thought he was a talented guy. He was raw. I think the time when I broke my neck in New York, I should have realized, because I was the veteran. I had been in the garden I don't know how many times, where with him it was the first time. I think he was nervous. I think the match had gone on for about 15, 16 minutes at the time and very sweaty, and I don't know if the nerves maybe made him tired too. Uh, I, I really am not positive or anything. All I know is that I got dumped on my head. And, uh, but to stand up, uh, uh, from that time, I wrestled him many times after that. He certainly uh, got better and better and better, and he became a very good talent. Did you know immediately that the neck was broken, or did you think it was, like, tweaked? I didn't know. Everything went kind of crazy. At first, I felt like a bolt of lightning went through my body, and then I was like uh, like I couldn't feel my body. Uh it was just such a weird thing that, and then I was told that I got up or, or he got me up or something, but I had no recollection of any of that or whatever took place after that. Next thing I know, I was in an ambulance going to a, to a hospital. You know, it's funny because, you know, I, 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 I've seen that match, and, you know, you, after after you break your neck, you just come back and make a comeback, knock him out of the ring and everything like I that. Did? I did? I never yeah, seen you know, that. <laughs> Yeah, you, you, you made a comeback, but I mean, when you when you went down and and I mean, it was you know, you got basically body slammed right on your head, uh -huh. and you could just see like it's like an um, like almost like a boxer knockout, and like for a couple of seconds there, it's like wow, you know, it's like how did they continue the match? But then I don't know what it was, but I mean, you you made it, you made a comeback like. And then I guess, I don't know, I, I mean, it's, but, but yeah, there was a comeback there. Well, you know, Dave, I've never seen the match. That's amazing. <laughs> Where did you, how did you see that match? 
Um, it was taped on the MSG cable, and um, I don't. I mean, I know I saw it years and years ago. No, no I, I never saw. It. All I know is that the, I found out later that the state athletic commissioner, and I forget his name, in New York, and he said uh, to somebody, he said somebody better, uh, or to the doctor, or somebody at ringside, and he says somebody better call an ambulance. Says, this guy's really hurt. I was told this later, not at the time. But I, I really have no recollection uh, of too much that happened afterwards. I don't know if it was instinct or what. I don't know. Hmm. Now, now, when you came back about uh, a couple months later for the Shea Stadium, yeah, um, and we talked about this one before. I mean, it's it's interesting because I was looking and I, I think it was a they were they were doing a, a, a retrospective of Stan's career, not your career, when he just retired in Japan. And they were showing like all his famous matches, which included you know many of his matches in that era with you. And you know it was it was funny because you know you mentioned how you know they basically took you out of a hospital bed. I mean that was probably the only photos I've ever seen of you from your entire career where you really were not you know you could see that you had not trained. You know, no like right before the the Shea, the Shea man, yeah, because you were not you were on your. Oh, on your you back. mean when I came back for the match with him in Shea Stadium? The Shea Stadium match, well, right? And it, Dave, and it was yeah, like, yeah. wow, you know. You, yeah, but you, maybe you, you have to understand. I was in a hospital. I oh no, had I this know. Ridiculous thing on me, and Vince McMahon was calling every day, saying that the uh, he had committed so many dollars with this Bob Arum for the Inaki, uh for not for Inaki, but for Muhammad Ali. And he said, if I don't make this match with uh, with Stan Hansen, he says we're going to be out of business. He said we have to make this match, and I'd say Vince, how can I, wh how can I do it? And, and I remember Dr. Lois Sivitri, so when the doctor, she got on the phone, he says to Vince McMahon, he says, how can you be talking about a match? He says, this guy is, just, is lucky that he's not paralyzed and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, McMahon would call daily, and the nurse would literally put the phone to my ear. And he said, Bruno, he says, we can do this match. We can do it in a way that your neck will be protected. You will not be touched. He says, but if we advertise that the match is going to take place, he says, it will bail us out. He says, I'm telling you, if we don't make the match, he says, we could be, we could go under. He says with the money that they had committed. So anyway, because it was close circuit, you see in the Northeast. Yeah, so, right. Uh, so anyway, uh, as time went on, we made the match. Of course, I didn't train. I, uh, my family was angry beyond the words that I can tell you. That Sivitri said, if you drop dead, he said you 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 brought it onto yourself. Or if you get worse, he says go. <laughs> he was mad because he was a friend. He says you have to go to a different. But I agreed to, to, to more or less because he made it so grave that that, he, that would have been the end. And so I agreed. And of course I didn't train. I didn't do anything. I just went there, and we were just going to pull a five-minute thing to where, you know, it was going to be strictly me uh, uh, doing a little bit of a number on him and then to think very, very quickly and survive the, the, the whole ordeal and bail McMahon out of the, the situation he got himself into. And that's basically what happened. So looking back, do you think that he was really in that grave a danger? McMahon? Yeah. Financially. You think being serious about that? Well, uh, uh, I, I can only tell you what they sure as heck convinced me of. They, they made <laughs> me believe that uh, it was that grave. If it wasn't, uh, I, I don't know. But at the time, they sure convinced me that it was that grave. But, but I don't know, Dave. I, I, Ryan, I, I think it, uh, if I didn't believe it, I probably wouldn't have uh, taken that chance. Yeah. Wes, anything else? I just want to ask Bruno one more real quick. Uh, in terms of, even though they weren't gimmicks in terms of costumes, what do you think of Vince Senior using, you know, like ethnic characters, you know, you know yourself for the Italians, Pedro Morales for Hispanics, Ivan Cole, in terms of, you know, drawing in particular at Madison Square Garden? You mean Vince McMahon Senior? Yes, sir. Uh, what did I think of that? I, I never give that a heck of a, a lot of thought. I thought that... Uh, for example, if Ivan Koloff or got over big, it was because of uh, the way he, uh, uh, the people perceived him, the way he wrestled, so forth. Because Killer Kowalski, you know, he was Killer Kowalski. Don Leo Jonathan was Don Leo Jonathan. I mean, Big Bill Miller, he was American. He was Big Bill Miller. But yes, we did have the Tor Tanaka, the Japanese. He had the Russian, uh, the German. Uh, that was something, I guess, that they had done for quite some time before I came into the business, and evidently they felt that there was a, a plus, or something that uh, uh, meant uh, meant a lot. I don't know, but I found, at least I, I think throughout my career, 
that it, I wrestled a lot of different people, and whether they were foreigners like that or whether they were American, you know, like I say, the Bill Miller, the Jonathans, and these kind of people, I don't think it made any difference at all as far as uh, it, it, the, the whole thing was how good was the individual, how good of a performer the individual was in getting himself over, uh, not, not necessarily just because he was a... Uh, uh, a Russian or a German or anything. Maybe after the war, it, it probably meant a lot more. I don't know, but uh, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it meant more than I'm suggesting. I, I really don't know. I never really paid that that much attention. That I always looked at the guy's talent, and I always felt that I saw something in him, whether I thought that he had what it took to to be an attraction or not. And I didn't look at necessarily at their national, you know, the nationality part of it. When you finally dropped the title for the last time with with Billy Graham, yeah. what was uh, your thoughts going into that? I mean, as far as as far as the guy, if he was the right guy to drop it to, and and you know, pretty much as I gather, uh, you'd kind of been wanting to drop it before then anyway, and it was kind of like. You know, was it just the guy at the right time, or was it like yeah. when you saw Billy Graham because he was so colorful at the time, you thought, okay, this is the right guy to drop it to? No, what I felt was that the first time I was more concerned that they did the, 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 got to get the right guy because, uh, you know, I was getting out, and, I, and as far as I was concerned, I was getting out for good. Not out of wrestling for good, but as far as that particular situation. That's, cool. that's, that's, that's Koloff, right? Yeah, and I was okay. very disappointed when they didn't give him a chance. I mean, they, they, they got rid of him after only about three weeks, and I thought that that was wrong. I thought that that was ridiculous because I felt that he could have uh, gone on for, uh, uh, you know, a call off or a gram, but they would have never lasted too, too long because that's just the nature of the business at that time. It's a lot easier to feed the villains to a good guy than it is to, to create good guys to keep feeding to, to a villain. It just it doesn't work. And, but with Billy, uh, the second time around, I'll be honest with you, I, McMahon had made a deal with me. If I'd come back, it would only have to be for one year. He gave me the song and dance. I think it's just a year to get the right guy. It's going to take us blah, blah, blah. And I went on. One year went to two, two went to three. Then I break my neck, you know. And, the, and then the fourth year, I, I, I frankly, I still love the business and all that stuff, but I just wanted out. Whoever, I wasn't going to argue or question anybody that they got. I just wanted out. I'm not against Billy, now don't misunderstand. But I'm just saying, I didn't give any thought or say, no, he's the right guy, he's the wrong guy. I just didn't care. I just wanted out, you know. I just wanted out of that situation. Okay, let's go to uh, Mike in Florida. Mike, what's going on? Hi, Bruno. It's a complete honor. I'm originally from Pittsburgh. Oh. And uh, grew up in Squirt Hill. Uh, oh, all right. There were two heroes in my life growing up in Pittsburgh. Uh, one was Roberto Clemente, and the other was Bruno San Martino. Well, thank you. I knew Roberto pretty well, but I thank you very much. I uh, I grew up watching uh, championship wrestling with your good friend Bill Cardill. Oh, yes. Uh, WIIC, uh, and I was there the night that Tony Marino dropped the mask as a little kid. Uh, I, I, I was thinking about what happened. Tony uh, dropped the mask, and he came out in his white outfit, in his white trunks, and... Uh, I actually used to box for Al Volkler in uh, in Pittsburgh and Wilkinsburg, and uh, I happened to be training one day, and here comes Joey Semino sitting at ringside. Oh, uh, yeah. And <laughs> I, I, I froze. And uh, Bruno, I, I just, uh, you know, before the, the people were chanting Rock and Hogan, uh, Bruno San Martino made professional wrestling what it is today. And uh, guys, hey, don't uh, blame me. For this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you do, do. No, I mean, uh, Bruno was. I mean, I, I've met you as a little kid at the Dapper Dan's. Oh yeah. And you, you were always the same as as the persona that everybody saw on TV. And uh, also, I want to thank you because I was one of those people that had written you. Oh. And uh, it, there, uh, I have a book. It's uh, and if you want to know, it's Meiselman's Sports Address Book. Huh. Okay, uh, I paid about thirty-nine bucks for it, and uh, your address is in there. Ah, oh, is that right? That's uh, where it's from. Uh, yeah, okay. it's uh, Meiselman's Sports Address, and uh, I wrote to Bruno, and I sent Bruno a picture that, that I had since I was ten years old. Uh, I think I, my father had taken me to every match uh, with the Bobby Hurricane Hunt, and. Oh, yeah. The Carnegie Cop and Johnny DeFazio and Dominic, uh, 
it's just a complete honor. And guys, uh, you've done your show a complete service. This is this is a hero to anybody in Pittsburgh. And uh, Bruno, we just love you. Well, God thank bless you very you. much. I appreciate, I appreciate the, you, the kind words. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'm I'm just going to leave it at that because uh, it's just a complete honor. My wife was going to go for a walk with me, and I said, No, I'm waiting to talk to Bruno. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but thank okay. you very much, and uh, take care of yourself. And uh, it's an honor. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you sir. again. Okay, we'll try to get one last caller in, uh, John in Florida. John, what's going on? Bruno, how you doing? I'm okay. How are you? <laughs> Listen, I got a question that's been bothering me. Okay. Okay. A lot of people trash Hulk Hogan, and I want to know: is it true why they trash him is because of the money he's made? He set he set an indoor attendance record, which no wrestler could ever break again. It's already been broken. True? It's already been broken. Who broke Oki, it? An Oki and Flair broke it. That's in Japan. I mean, here in the states. Well, she was in Korea, but. Uh, if you got a big enough building, you know, somebody else could break it. They happen to wrestle in the biggest well, building, that's all. Well, you're talking about the, the gig, like uh, at, at the, sil the Silver Dome and that. He's talking about yeah. the Silver Dome, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, but keep in mind, now wait a minute, in all fairness, I'm not going to give him all the credit for that. Keep in mind, that was WrestleMania, and they built WrestleMania to be this spectacular thing nationwide. To be perfectly honest with you, if it was such a hot item, how come then I was still with the WWF as a commentator when they went back to the to, to, to that big stadium in Detroit, in Michigan, and he wrestled, I forget who, and they, and they did as little as 9,000 people. How do you go from supposedly 90,000 to 9,000? Now, so you see, when you have a spectacular thing like that, like WrestleMania, it, it's, it's it, you know, they have the movie stars and outside athletes. And they make such a spectacle of it that you can't just give the credit and say he alone was responsible for that. I, hey, I consider my match with Zabisco with 46,000 people in Shea Stadium bigger than that for the simple reason that it was strictly a local show advertised strictly for, for there, for New York, and no place else. And it was just a local show, and that's it. And, and we did that many people. And keep in mind, the Silver Dome, and Dave would know better than me whether this is true or not, but this is what I was told time and again, that that 90,000 they keep talking about, that 30,000 of those were actually giveaways. Is that true, not, Dave? Not quite that, not, not quite that many, but um, I think the paid was about 70, was it 74? 74, 74, 74 paid and like 78 in the building or something. Yeah. Okay, Bruno. Yeah. Is it also true that people are jealous because he was getting percentages of pay-per-views? Every appearance on Nitro, he was making money. Every appearance on Thunder. <laughs> well, well, I, I don't know what you mean. Who they? Who they are? Because I never knew what kind of money he was making. I All the wrestlers. That the that's who they are. Uh, All the wrestlers that trash him today. He's not a nice guy. I, I went to his house. Yeah. In um, Clearwater, he treated me like a king. <laughs> I got pictures of me in the, at his house in his viper. He yeah. doesn't invite just strangers to his house. Well, yes, he does. <laughs> well, I don't know what to tell you. John, All I know is that as a wrestler, I resented the fact of the uh, the uh, when you're talking about to the kids and the parish and the thing, and the guy is is a big uh, 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 is a big drug user, like you know, with the steroids and all that kind of crap. Uh, I felt that uh, that he was. Uh, he, he, I just felt that there was a lot of wrong that going on at period with all the different things that they were doing, uh, drugs Man, of all kinds. And I just felt that uh, that Man, I needed Roman. to see that in my business. And I felt that a guy like him, being that he was on top, if anything, he should have been a spokesman to keep to keep the business uh, clean and to keep a lot of that stuff out instead of uh, instead of being one of the participants. We're going to go to Bob in Rhode Island. We're going to get one, one last caller in. Bob, what's, what's going on? Hi, Bruno. Uh, Dave, great show. Brian, you too. Uh, Bruno, I just want to thank you for all the shows that you put on in the 70s in Providence and in Boston. I mean, you were the greatest. I can hardly hear you. I'm sorry about that. But uh, I, I heard you saying that you saw me in, in Providence. Is that what you what Yeah, I, heard? Uh, I wanted to thank you. For all the shows that you put on in Providence and in Boston in the 70s, I never missed any of them. Oh, thank you. And you truly are the greatest. I have two quick questions, though. One, is there, are you, are you planning on writing a book? No. You're not. Come on. Well, you know what? <laughs> you know, these guys today can write books because wrestling, you know, gets a lot of no right now with, with the media so that they can get publishers and that. I did one book in 19, uh, 90 and the people, local people here, they didn't even have the uh, ability to, to put it nationwide. It was more local than anything else. I wouldn't go through that again. I don't think so. 
And just one other thing. Uh, is it true that uh, Rodgers had a heart attack before you beat him with the 48 Well, seconds? I wish I had time. I, <laughs> I don't think they will tell you at the time because I, that's another thing I wanted to clear up. Absolutely not, and I could tell you, I could clarify that very, very well, but I don't think that the Davis got the time right now. But some other time, that's another point that I like to clear up because I, I, I be, believe me, I know the whole story and uh, never. The, the only time he had heart trouble was when he had a bypass surgery, and, and at the time he was close to 70 years of age, if not 70 years of age. Let me tell you how it all started. The, the, how, how the, the whole thing came about. How the, in Pittsburgh, how Paul Sullivan was the guy that uh, made him go to a uh, hospital to, uh, because they suspended his license when he claimed he had chest pains and, and uh, they, they, after spending a week in the hospital his, his license was taken completely away from everywhere and he was given a complete and total clean bill of health the way he got the chest pains was he came to Pittsburgh he was on top he came in with a big cigar with his usual strut but when he looked out at the arena half hour before the show started there were like 800 people the building goes about 19,000 and he said I'm not going to wrestle in an empty arena so he told the doctor that he had uh, some chest pains. When the doctor heard that, he said, I can't let you wrestle. But he reported to Paul Sullivan, who was a very strict athletic commission. And Paul Sullivan put out the word that this guy was having these problems. And until it was resolved, that he was suspended, uh, license all over. And that's when he, he got very angry, Rogers, because he thought he was just going to get out of that show that night. But then all this came up, and then McMahon put him in this uh, hospital in Washington, D.C., where he stayed for, I, I, I don't remember how many days, but I remember the time where they put him through every imaginable test there was, and he got a complete bill, a clean bill of, of health, and then he came out, and then he was, he, he, the license was reissued to him, and he continued his career. Later on, after the last to me, he said that they took him in a, in a ring and practically in a stretcher, because two weeks before, he had had a heart attack, and two weeks before, I wrestled him on TV, you know what D.C. Uh, uh, because my opponent was supposed to show up and he was going to teach me a lesson and he came in the ring. We wrestled on TV which was a bigger build up for the big match in Madison Square Garden. It was all a lie. People can believe what they want to believe but I know exactly what happened and he never had a heart attack. If he did have a heart attack it was when he was 70 years old because they had to do a bypass surgery on him. Yeah, the greatest you know, it's, 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 it's funny if you look back at... Um... 1962-63 and Buddy Rogers as NWA champion and then with the, with the, with WWF champion. Yeah. You will see a lot of similarities in Buddy Rogers and Shawn Michaels, both in in the ring and out of the ring. Is that right? Um, and yeah, Shawn was really good at not dropping. Shawn was really good at getting hurt before his title match when he was supposed to lose too. Very convenient. <laughs> well, Rogers didn't like to wrestle before in a. In an empty, empty arena. And at the end of his career, he was doing a lot of it because New York had really <laughs> gone down the tubes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Bruno, I want to thank you very much for doing the show. Hey, I enjoyed uh, it, guys. I enjoyed it, too, and we got to get you back. We got uh, a lot of uh, feedback on it uh, tonight, and uh, <laughs> there's a lot more stories, I'm sure, that we didn't even touch that we can still talk about. So, Anytime, uh, Dave. Just let me know, and I'll be your guest. And I... Sorry if I took too much time in, in, in clearing that one point, but it kind of bothered me, and I wanted to bring it out. But the next time, it will be, it will, you know, do it all yours and all your callers, and I will not interject with any other stories. Okay, great. No, you no, that's, that's the best we part like of the, the show. Don't kid yourself. We like the no, long that's what you, We love the stories. Oh, well. um, anyway, anyway, uh, we will be back here uh, tomorrow. We're going to have uh, God. Now I, I I'm pulling a blank. Who do we have tomorrow, Al? Crowbar. We got Chris Ford, Chris Ford, Crowbar. That's right. I've been looking forward to the show as well. So anyway, we'll see you tomorrow at 5.